Welcome to the Acario podcast. Once again, helping you break free from the human zoo, achieve your full potential with your hosts, Ollie. And what about what about becoming a force to be reckoned with? Are we we not can't doing... forget. I, 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 I lost that one. I was halfway through it. I was confidently doing it. I was like, right, there's a third one. And I've totally forgotten it. I thought Shane will address it. And you did. So that's fine. Okay, great. Do not forget it's... to become a force to be reckoned with. Yes. Okay. Right. Oh, man. <laughs> our, great, great start. Our, our intros are about as good as our outros. <laughs> but listen, we have an important topic to talk about, which is there's something that really... This has come up so many times in the last few weeks where we're just like, we have to talk about this. We are going to solve a problem here that seems to be like a really widespread problem in the greater area of personal development, which is the the seeming conflict, the apparent paradox or conflict between self-acceptance and a desire for growth, ambition, learning, and so on. Okay, so this is the thing. This is something that comes up and we've just encountered this in many like conversations and content pieces and so on recently where we're like, okay, we have to talk about this because it comes up in so many different contexts when people talk about personal development or learning or getting better or getting strong or whatever it is, where it seems like, I guess the, let's, let's define the problem first, right? It seems like if I truly accepted myself, If I found a way to accept myself exactly as I am, then I would just turn into a lazy bum. Then I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't work out anymore. I wouldn't ambitiously pursue uh, entrepreneurial goals. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to succeed anymore. And so that that's basically the problem. And I've seen many people talk about this in a way where they're like trying to present a solution to this and they just miss the mark. And this is completely solvable, and that's what we're going to do here. Quite an ambitious goal, but we're going to we're going to tackle it once and for all because we've seen I've heard people talk about this, whether it's on podcasts or in other pieces of content I've I've looked at, and it just seems that they haven't quite nailed it, or yeah. they haven't quite come to a place of reconciliation with these two seeming opposites within totally, themselves, yeah. and yeah. it's like they just. They're trying their best to address the problem, but it's just they still don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes sense because I think for many of us, that is where certain pursuits of of personal development, of growth, of skill growth, and so on, start. They start from from a feeling of inadequacy. They start from a place of, in other words, it's like at some point, for example, I stand in front of the mirror and I go, I look chubby. I don't like what I look like. And that's why I go to the gym. So like the, the, the thing that makes me start going to the gym is a dissatisfaction with something that I see in myself. And it might be something else as well. Oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm always the unpopular kid. Everybody makes fun of me. And then I go, I'm going to show you. I'm going to be the most successful, whatever. And then I work really hard and I pursue a career or whatever, right? And it's this initial experience of I'm dissatisfied with myself or even I hate something about myself and that drives action. And then, and I, like I said, I think many of us experience something like that in our lives. And then we hold on to that because then it's like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to go back to being a loser. I don't want to go back to being, you know, fat, lazy, unsuccessful, etc. So I have to continue hating myself. I have to keep this going. Yeah, so they'll keep it alive. And, yeah. and I'm saying this from experience because when I first started working with you, this is one of the, one of the first of many uh, profound bits of, of insight and wisdom you sort of shared with me is I arrived and started working with you and had this belief that if I... I had this exact same belief where if I thought that if I didn't have some sort of, um, I guess, perceived inadequacy with regards to myself then I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take action anymore. Hmm. And I thought to myself, well, I know that I read a lot about self-acceptance and I'm from a bit of a Buddhist background, which concerns itself with that. Um, but I just, for, for me, I couldn't reconcile those two um, seeming contradictions. And, and your advice was just try it out. Why don't you try accepting yourself for a bit and see what happens? 
Because mm-hmm. there was a fear there. There was a, there was a fear that I'd just sit there and eat, I'd just sit here and just eat pizza all the time and I'd never move. I'd just be in my room <laughs> all day. And that was the irrational fear. And your, your take was like, all right, see it. Yeah. <laughs> Try it out. Let's see what happens. It'd be, at, at the very least, it'd be a great content piece. So exactly. Ollie's accepted himself. He just eats pizza all day now. Yeah. But this I mean, is the result. How, how funny would it be? How funny would it be <laughs> if that was the experience? Like I, I achieved like true deep self-acceptance and it totally derailed my life like from then on it's like you know a, a month later I, I got evicted and I was just like I'm overweight and I'm basically homeless now because I just accept myself so fully it just destroyed me <laughs> you know how funny would that be and in the context of Ikari I was like yeah this is that's worth trying out that we, we could make that content piece and I'm sure you could you could probably rekindle your self-loathing right I'm sure you can find a way to hate yourself again if that's really what it takes yeah, we, we did mention this to another another member of the Acario team the other day. Yeah. It's like, but this, I feel this guilt, mm-hmm. and this guilt seems to drive me forward. Mm-hmm. And your, your response was exactly that. It was like, okay, well, why don't you let, try letting go of the guilt for a bit? Don't worry. You can find things to get guilty about later. You can always bring the guilt back if you yeah. found that you've lost your motivation. If that was the thing that was motivating you and you've lost it, it seems that guilt is something that could be pretty easy to find if right, you wanted yeah. to. I'm sure I'm sure you can manage. I'm sure you can manage. But yeah. so that's that's the basic problem. And I think that's that's right away that can potentially open up your mind to this, right? If you just consider the the possibility, instead of just taking the this fear at face value, just as ooh, don't let go of these negative feelings, otherwise, it's like, okay, let's explore that. Let's explore that idea. What exactly happens if I accept myself? And and yeah, just be open to finding out, finding out in practice. And we're, we're going to talk a bit more about that. But another thing I've, I, I want to continue developing this a little bit because another thing I've often seen when, when people in the self-development space talk about this is that it is framed as some kind of a paradox, for example, or it's like, well, somehow it's just paradoxical. On the one hand, self-acceptance is important, but on the other hand, you're driven by shame and guilt and whatever, inadequacy. And somehow, oh, it's just weird, right? This is a weird paradox. Or it's some kind of a balancing act, you know? It's like, yes, some self-acceptance is good for you and some of this kind of shame is good for you and because this one drives action and this one makes you feel good and it's kind of, you know, you've got to find the middle ground. No, it just, no. That, that one just sounds, I've got to say, that one just sounds like a bit of a cop-out, doesn't it? Totally, It's, it's yeah. just saying, the ba- just balance. It's all yeah. about balance. Like, you can say that about so many <laughs> yeah. things and it would apply. But it's almost true. like you've not really fully fully <laughs> answered this question, you know. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, on the other hand, you know, I see people wrestle with this. I see people struggle with this, and I totally understand that. And also to be to be clear, I totally come from that. It's like my I got my start. Like the reason I started working on myself was because I really had a very strong experience of just being a complete failure. I I, I was made to feel through my experiences in school. In my childhood, I was made to feel like I was just a complete waste of space. And I was made to feel like I'm just bad at everything and I'm a nuisance and basically be better if I didn't exist. And it was from that that... So I have that experience too where I was like, well, at some point, luckily, I came across the idea that maybe I could improve myself. And I thought that I have to. I have to work on myself in order to get myself to a level of that's like normal where everyone else is. That was, that's how it started. It felt like I have to work really hard to, to get to the level of where people are at when they just roll out of bed, right? Where mm. normal people are at. So I, I totally understand this. And it took me a long time to, to change my mind about that. And I'm, and I'm glad that I did. And there is a resolution for this. And I don't want to tease this any longer. I think there's one thought experiment that we can do that clearly shows that this is not a paradox or a balance. And and here it is. Picture a baby. Okay? Picture a baby. Let's say we have a baby here. And then we look at this baby and go, you know what? This baby is useless. This baby can't take care of itself, can't talk, can't walk. It's not contributing to, to society. It's not being productive. It's like, what are you doing to raise the GDP, right? You are useless. <laughs> this baby is useless. And I'm measuring this baby against a fully developed adult. I'm saying, look, look, at, look at this. Look at this. this is, you're terrible. You're terrible. <laughs> and because you're so terrible, that is why 
I am invested in helping you grow and learn and become better, right? It's because of your inadequacy, because all I see, all I see is lack. And this lack drives me to encourage you to learn and to help you grow and so on and so on. Surely if I fully accepted and loved this baby just as it is, I would just totally neglect it, right? <laughs> then I wouldn't, I would no longer, it's like, no, you don't have to learn how to speak. You don't have to learn anything. And I'm, I'm probably just going to completely neglect this child if I actually fully accept it and love it. Right. Doesn't that sound absolutely bizarre? It's, uh, yeah. Okay. It, do, it does sound, it does sound bizarre. In this, so in this, in this metaphor, the baby would be what? Your... Your sort of potential, the thing that you're trying to... No, it's a literal baby. It's a literal baby. <laughs> Think about this. When you see when you see a, an infant, or it could also be a, a puppy or a kitten or something, it's like, yes, this is... It is useless, basically, right? It, it's true that th there's a lot of lack. If you compare this to a fully developed person, <laughs> all kinds of things are missing, Right? Also, the physique of this baby is not great. You know? <laughs> Muscular development, totally missing, too much chub. Like, this is Do you even lift, bro? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Honestly, are you even trying? Right? <laughs> it's true. These are all true things. But <laughs> clearly, it is not a requirement that you, that you hate this or feel bad about it or, or even perceive this as a horrible lack. It's not a requirement for you to want to help this child grow and develop, right? And the, the same is true for you. You basically have a relationship to yourself in such a way as well. And unfortunately, look, one of the reasons that I'm, I'm using a baby as an example is because unfortunately, many of us relatively early in childhood do start to experience that we, we get the feeling that people are disappointed in us, that we're, that we're not living up to expectations and so on. And then that starts this kind of I have to grow because of my inadequacy thing. But you can clearly see, so and that, that's why I go all the way back to a baby, right? And But just the way you can see a baby and you can see that you can fully accept and love this creature for what it is and still 100% want it to grow and learn and get better and get stronger and so on. And I think a baby is a good example because we feel that very strongly. We feel both the love and acceptance very strongly, but also you feel so strongly that you want this child to grow up and, and to become excellent, right? You want that really strongly. And I think that we have a, a relationship with ourselves that, uh, that is a lot like that as well, just like a relationship we have with someone else, right? Because most of us, we talk to ourselves and we judge ourselves and we do all this kind of stuff that we usually do, that we also do externally with other people. Right? Yeah. And so... What I'm saying is the attitude that you're having towards yourself, the way you talk to, to yourself when it comes to your personal growth and your acceptance and so on, is very, very different from how you look at a baby. And I would argue how you would also want to look at a toddler, at a child, at a teenager, and even another adult. Unfortunately, we lose that. Most of us lose that very early on. And you can also think of this like, you know, maybe you come out of an environment where you didn't experience anything like that. Maybe your first memories are that you felt inadequate. Maybe you did have parents or guardians who were, who basically only saw lack in you, right? But that probably wasn't like your favorite childhood experience, right? That probably wasn't the good part of your childhood. And I, I would assume that most people don't want to be like that. We wouldn't, if you're, if you're a parent or if you want to become a parent, you probably don't want to be that kind of parent. You don't want to be a parent who just, what, shames your child into performance or something, hmm. right? But again, pay attention, pay attention to how easy it is to imagine completely and fully accepting and loving a baby or a puppy even. You know, still, <laughs> you know your audience. <laughs> you know you're talking to me right now. Yeah, and still completely and deeply wanting growth and and learning and and so on and so forth for this creature, right? There's and so this is the point. Like, think about this and feel this. There is no paradox here. This, you're not carefully balancing two things. 
These things have nothing to do with each other, basically. Right. So self-acceptance and growth yeah. have nothing to do with each other. They can, they can be completely independent. And more than that, but just like, yes, you probably have the experience of a desire for growth being fueled by a sense of inadequacy. But just the same, a desire for growth can be fueled by a sense of love and acceptance. Right. That makes sense. So I just, I misspoke a second ago. I said, uh, what is it? Self-acceptance and growth are not, uh, and can be completely different. But what I meant to say was inadequacy and growth. Right. Because yes. it's, it's basically like people believe that inadequacy and growth have to, have to come together. Exactly. Like you yes. would never grow yes. unless you felt inadequate. Yes. And, and that's what, simply not the case. And what yeah. you're saying is growth doesn't have to be motivated by inadequacy. Not at all. Yeah. Growth can be motivated by the same thing that would motivate you to take care of a baby. Yeah. Which is just, um, what would you de describe that as? Well, it is. So I, I also have that. I can also say this, like if we, if we move away from the, from the baby example, right? I have this too now in my life. I've gotten to this point where, for example, I was just telling you before we started recording, I had a pretty hard workout today. And so I work out. And why do I work out? Well, because it's good for me, but also it's like I want to grow stronger and more flexible and I want to learn new movement skills and so on. So I, I clearly, there, there are things that I don't have yet that I want, but I don't look at myself in the mirror and go, oh, this is, oh, this is terrible. Oh, I'm too small, I'm too fat, I'm too whatever, right? I like the way I look. And I, and I can fully acknowledge, look, I'm already far stronger and more flexible and more capable of physical movement than most people are, which let's be honest, a low bar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most, pe like, most people my age are, yeah, are basically terrible at moving. And so I can fully acknowledge that this is already pretty damn good and I have no problems with my physical appearance at all. And yet I want to grow stronger. And it's just, it's almost like, yeah, you're asking me, well, what is it, what is this fueled by? I don't know. I just want to. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's kind of hard to explain. I can relate to that in terms of um, physical training as well. For, the, for a very long time, I think what got me in the gym was wanting to get a six pack because I wanted to be attractive to women. Mm -hmm. So it was like an ina inadequacy that got me in there. But it always felt like a struggle. I never really enjoyed it. I was just dragging myself to the gym and pushing myself to to train in such a such a, an aggressive kind of way, just like mm. in a way that I wasn't really enjoying, like basically hit training, I can't stand it, but like <laughs> I was forcing myself to do it. Um, never really enjoyed it. But until I think the past few years, I started doing things I really enjoyed. And over time, the, the inadequacy just, it just sort of went away. And mm. it's like, it's not about, it's not driven by, oh, I need to look better. It's more like, I like to lift heavy stuff. I like to yep. throw some weights around. Um, but one thing I wanted to, to ask was, if so i'm trying to i'm trying to comprehend why this is such a a, a problem for people why mm -hmm. this is such a a sticky idea why this is yeah. why, why the, the belief that inadequacy has to drive action is such a sticky idea for people and the i can't help but think that there must be in, there must be some um some way that a person can justify that to themselves like for example someone could say that's all well and good, Shane. Um, but you said that a lot of the things that, that sparked your growth came from inadequacy. Yeah. So therefore, can we not say that inadequacy is was ultimately a good thing? Mm -hmm. And then they can make a, 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 a judgment of that, that inadequacy must be a good thing. It drives growth. Because yeah. yeah. then someone can retroactive, retroactively look back on your life and say, at these points, inadequacy was felt. That sparked you to grow. Mm -hmm. Therefore... You're talking out your hat. So yeah. inadequacy is a good thing, is it not? Yeah, yeah. So I think that there's actually quite a lot of truth in that because I think that, or at least in my life, I've had the experience that it it often is difficult to tell in the moment whether something is good or bad. I've had many things that I experienced that in the moment definitely didn't feel good, but that I look back on and think, oh, I'm kind of glad this happened because of how it shaped me as a person. And... And yes, it's true. Or another way to say that, you know, if if I had like a time machine or I had like the, I could go back in time and like change things about my past, I'd be very careful to change anything because I really like where I ended up. And so 
I agree that something that is that is less than ideal and something that is even a form of suffering, such as feelings of inadequacy, it, it can be used as fuel for something positive. But the question is, well, first of all, that doesn't mean that's the only way to end up here. Right? It doesn't mean that if I had a different experience in school, for example, and I didn't have these feelings of inadequacy, it doesn't mean that I wouldn't have developed myself. Surely it would have certainly changed something, but maybe I would be doing something else that I love. Maybe I would be excellent at other things. Who's to say whether that's better or worse? So just because, you know, just because this is a recipe, let's say, that worked in my life, doesn't mean that this is the ideal recipe. And one way to think of it is like, okay, well, would you want to visit this kind of trauma on your child? Because like, oh, yeah, I experienced bad things and I turned out fine. Well, therefore, should my child experience bad things? Like, should I make sure that my child gets like the right kind of abuse, you know? And well, I think, again, I think as a sane person, you'd be like, no, I, I'd like to find a non-traumatic way to encourage this kind of growth, right? Mm -hmm. But here, another thing that, look, this this will, this probably sounds boastful, but but here's kind of a counter argument to this, is of course you can say, well, you know, you experienced these bad things and, and you, you had this sense of, you had this kind of shame-driven uh, search of performance and so on, and look at how what it got you, you know, aren't you successful and stuff like that now? Yes, but let me tell you this, Self-acceptance is something that I, gladly I came across like the idea that this is valuable and important to develop a long time ago. And for many, many years, this is something that I, I feel like I slowly, slowly chipped away at my self-hatred and developed you know, deep self-acceptance, which is right away, which means that most of my success happened in a state of deeper self-acceptance than most people have. But but let's even let's even discount that. A few years ago, about three years ago, I had an experience of something that felt like a breakthrough in terms of self acceptance and self love. Where so even after years and years of working on it, where I already felt like I have a, a greater a greater depth of self acceptance than than most people have, and I experienced kind of a breakthrough where I I felt like I dug really deep in my psyche and found some really deeply rooted kind of fears and, and self-loathing and so on, and managed to work that out. So that's about three years ago. So if we take that as a as kind of a, an important event, it's like, let's say maximum self-acceptance. I don't know if that's a claim I can make, but let's say that's maximum self-acceptance happened three years ago. In those three years, I've made more money than in my entire life before that. So if... You, so a counter argument could be, sure, yes, my feelings of inadequacy and so on led to self-development and success and so on, but I've had more success than ever before since that time that I had this breakthrough in self-acceptance. So, you know, if, if argument A is valid, argument B is also valid. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As I say, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, that, first of all, I think that's, that's really cool because that means that you can sort of, you know, you can you can have your cake and eat it, really. Yeah. It means you can accept yourself completely as you are right now. And that will not cripple your motivation. Although what I will say is it may cripple your motivation to do things that you do not want to do. Yes. It may cripple your motivation to do things that you thought that you had to do to impress your parents or someone yes. else. Yes. So that might be a fear that people have. It's yeah. like, if I actually accepted myself, then so many things would change. And deep down, they know that. And it's like, no, because I don't want to do that because my life could, I don't know what I, where I could end up. Exactly. So yeah, this is a great point. So I think to, to explore this a bit further, right? One possibility here is, let's say you're studying to become a dentist or something because that's what your parents want from you. There's like, or the external world, you feel like this is what I have to do. And yes, if you develop full self-acceptance, you might get to the truth that you don't want to be a dentist. And that would lead to other painful consequences. But then, you know, you're, you're going to probably be miserable as a dentist too. So you just like pick your points. And like. <laughs> so that can definitely happen. Another thing, actually, you know, you talked about like, like six packs and stuff. I had that too at one point. 
that obviously, you know, I, I started seeing, you know, as a teenager, I started seeing like depictions of, of male physiques in popular culture. It's like, oh, okay, that's what I have to look like. <laughs> and also the idea that if I had a six pack, then finally girls would like me, of course, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For me, it was watching like uh, playing with Action Man. You know, oh, really? Action Man and G.I. Joes and stuff. Yeah. And these guys had serious guns. <laughs> yeah. They had that sort of weird bulge in the middle of the bicep and the tricep, that little bit that comes out. And I'm like, I don't even know that. I didn't even know that muscle existed. <laughs> Does <laughs> but, it exist? Do you have, is that... Yeah, it's like some people, they have like a bicep that gets too so big that there's this middle bit that pushes out. <laughs> but only when people are absolutely yeah. shredded. Yeah. But apparently all these guys, all, apparently yeah. I learned from a young age, all men should have that. Yeah, all men should have that. And I never short. did. I was like, what's yeah. going on Damn. here? There's something wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, let's carry on. Yeah, so... <laughs> So yeah, I definitely had that as well at some point. And I did, at one point, I did a pretty crazy like training program and cut so that I did get to the point where I had a six pack, like an undeniable crisp six pack, right? And it was miserable, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I was just obsessed with food. All I could think of was food, right? Because I had just been on a, on a caloric deficit for so long. But anyway... Um, but it was also, I felt like I'm, I'm glad I did that, you know, because I proved to myself I could do this, okay? But here's the thing. If you come from the frame is, I must have a six pack. I must be super ripped because that's how people will love me and respect me and, and all this kind of stuff. Then yes, what might happen is if you if you develop true self-acceptance, you might not have a six pack and be okay with that, right? You might find that I don't care about having a six pack. And your present you was attached to the importance of having a six pack. It's like, no, no, I don't want to become, I don't want to become the guy who doesn't have a six pack and doesn't care. I want to be the guy who has a six pack. But here's the thing, right? So this is basically where I am now, right? I think that so right now I'm in a pretty good shape. I'm not in any worse, I'm certainly in better shape than when I was shaming myself. <laughs> <laughs> but also I don't have a six pack and I have no plans of, <laughs> of having one because because yeah it's because here's the thing there's a level deeper right on the one hand you can say oh well you just you know you kind of just fooled yourself what's the real key is don't you want the six pack and you're just in some kind of delusion where you're feeling good about yourself but you don't have a six pack so you're actually a loser right dude yeah there's so many people that take that line with it whereas if you mm -hmm. talk to them and say you know what i don't really mind anymore they're like don't you mind or have you just given up on your goals exactly it's yeah, like yeah, oh. just given up but here's the thing look there's something beyond that it's like why did you want the six pack so well you wanted people to look at you and be like oh this guy's hot you wanted probably if you're a guy, you wanted a six-pack, basically you wanted to have sex with women, right? Most likely, or sex with men, depending on what you prefer. But mm. it's like, you want to get laid. That's that's usually a big driving factor in, in having a six-pack. Okay, well, I can get laid. That's, I'm, I'm attractive to women, right? That's not a problem. So I have the thing that you actually wanted. I don't have the six-pack, but I have the reason why you wanted the six-pack, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so... That's also interesting to explore. And also, you know, it's like, okay, you want to you wanna look good. Dude, I look good enough, like whatever. And <laughs> you want, you want, yeah, you want to be attractive to your preferred gender, check. You, you want to be respected by other people? Yeah, sure. I don't need a fucking six pack to be respected by people, it, right? Yeah. So if you think one step further, at why do I want these things? Then yeah, you can totally have that with total self-acceptance and you don't have to be on a starvation diet the entire time this is the thing for me it's always intuitively felt like like self-acceptance and being at peace with who you are is is the thing that sort of transcends all of these other achievements right and i had this conversation with a friend a few years ago about money he wanted to be a millionaire and i was like all right sure mm -hmm. I was like do you think like he, his 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 line was everyone should be trying to be a millionaire and i was like right because i don't really i don't really care about that and it's like you're kidding yourself <laughs> and i was thinking no dude i'm just i'm i what i'm trying to do here is reach a point where i i'm just totally at peace with myself and it, it's like he couldn't fathom that as mm. being desirable at all he's like yeah but well where does that get you what does that give you and i was like Jesus, we're not going to get anywhere in this conversation, are we? Because <laughs> I was like, for me, the 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 uh, a, a great state to be in is that state of 
it seems to be more important than any achievement on the external. Yeah. Um, but obviously in this case, it's the six pack thing. Mm -hmm. And just to support what you just said, yeah, it's one of the reasons why I stopped being a personal trainer because I recognize that people, um, I got working with a lot of people that want to get six packs and stuff. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's all get six packs. And I just recognize that actually there's just loads of people that feel inadequate and they want to be attractive mm -hmm. and they actually feel unattractive and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, yeah. it's the thing that you think the six pack is going to give you yeah, that you're actually seeking. Um, and so, you know, I think this is, this is, this serves as a really good example because also note that we're not saying that when you achieve self-acceptance and you just be like morbidly obese because you don't care about your physique anymore. Because like I said, I still want to be stronger and more capable and better at moving and so on and so forth. And and yeah, it's and just because I don't have like the, you know, the the paper thin skin on top of my abs, like I have adequately visible abs. Like what more do you want? It's you know what I mean? It's like it's not that it's not like this extreme black or white. It's not that you're either you're either all in and you're just a self-hating six-pack haver or you're just a complete slob, right? It's that there is there is a a path where you really like you said it's like you can eat your cake and have it too. It's like you can still pursue your important goals, including your fitness goals. You can still look good and so on and so forth. And it doesn't have to be driven by any kind of self-hatred. And this is also true like for things like financial goals and entrepreneurship and so on. You know, especially like people who like you who work with me directly, who know the bigger picture and longer term plans of what I want to do with Ikario, you know that this is the most ambitious thing I have ever created. This is not this is not me going, okay, I succeeded with a software business, now I'm just like chilling out and doing some hippie stuff, you know? It's like this is the most ambitious entrepreneurial project I've ever started. And if this works out, this is also financially going to be a huge step up from anything I've done before. So my self-acceptance hasn't like taken away my edge, you know? I'm not suddenly like, oh, I don't care anymore. Again, like, I guess that's what we keep coming back to. There's this idea you're afraid that you're going to lose sight of your goals or that you're going to lose your ambition. But that just absolutely doesn't have to be connected to gaining self-acceptance at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's there's two things I wanted to say. <clears throat> um, one of them is, so we can find some examples of people who are who are successful in whatever field. And we can we can certainly find examples of them of inadequacy being the driver for success for those people but it's this survivorship bias isn't it where we find the people who succeeded f uh, from a, driven by a place of inadequacy like olympians who were driven by overbearing parents who never were never athletic in their life and like you need to be athletic now they're living vicariously through the children mm -hmm. we can find examples of, of that and be like well then inadequacy Yes, inadequacy must lead to success. It's like, no, because what you're not seeing is the millions upon millions of people who hate themselves and they're just, they're just stuck and stagnant in their lives. And after working with a fair few um, morbidly obese people as a personal trainer, um, people who could barely move pretty much, they could only be on like a, like a treadmill walking uphill and stuff like that. And having really in-depth conversations with, with, with those people, I'm not saying that everyone who's in that shape hates themselves, but these people certainly did mm. that it was it was essentially a form of gradual self harm that they were overfeeding themselves because they didn't think deep down they deserved to be attractive to a partner they deserved to feel good it was actually this um deep inadequacy that was slowly killing them yeah so when people say that inadequacy is probably a good thing it drives success it's like you are ignoring probably 90% of the examples there Mm -hmm. um, maybe more than that. Yeah, and what's simply happening is that, like we said in the beginning, I think in our culture that's the common experience that you that you're made to feel inadequate in various ways. So you know you get bad grades, and people tell you why don't you work harder, and so on and so forth, right? And so yeah, well, if everybody's walking around feeling inadequate, some of them are going to succeed, some of them are going to fail, and then you can look at the successes and say, well, see, they do they feel like that. Well, that doesn't say that doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah.
There's the second thing I wanted to ask, which was, um, so, and I, I'm thinking in the, in the mind of some people who maybe are driven by inadequacy and they're listening to you, like, I don't, I've, I've reached sort of a place of self-acceptance and I've taken on this Acario project, which is, which is my most ambitious goal yet. I'm not driven by that. You can have some people that will be like, yeah, he's, he's bullshitting. Mm. What is he really driven by? Surely, right. surely not. <laughs> right, so right. what I wanted to address and wanted to cover was, what is it then, just to give people an idea as to yeah. what motivation can look like in the absence of shame or inadequacy, mm -hmm. what is it then that drives you to do that in the absence of this is not enough? Yeah. I want to I want to start with the exercise example again. Because you can obviously you can go to the gym and do workouts and so on because you feel like you have to look better and so on, but also it can be really fun to move. And it can be really fun, for example, it can feel really good to lift heavy weights. And and in fact, I think you said this before as well. It's like even if there was no benefit to this, you would still want to do it because it just feels good. It just feels good to put a lot of weight on a barbell and pull it or push it in some way. It just feels good, <laughs> right? And so that is a big reason. And for me, I'm like that as well. I had that, I'm not that much into heavy lifting anymore, but I definitely had this experience as well. It just feels good to feel your own strength when you are moving heavy weights. And now I'm more interested in, in like movement skills and so, for example, you know, doing a handstand, it just feels good to have that, to, to feel your body doing this and develop this sense of balance and get better at it over time. And the handstand is actually a great example because what the hell does that do for me? <laughs> that it does nothing for me, you know? W w I can't buy anything with, with being able to do a handstand. It's probably not even, you know, is it like healthy? Because you can say, well, if you, if you do, you know, lift heavy weights and so on, it has all these health benefits. Does doing a handstand have health benefits? I don't know. I'm certainly not doing it in pursuit of some health benefit. It feels good to do this. And I feel like that a lot about all kinds of movements. I just enjoy moving my body and I enjoy like feeling the strength and flexibility and mobility of my body. This is something I deeply enjoy. And that is one reason to do something. I also, I love learning things. I absolutely love learning things. And of course you could say that for example, I read a lot and I write a lot and I try to assimilate what I learn and so on. And of course you could say, well, you're doing this to further your career to make yourself more successful or whatever. Well, okay, but I read books about all kinds of stuff. Right? It would make sense if I was just like reading business book after business book or trying to become a better entrepreneur or something. But no, I, I read books about all kinds of stuff. Like one of my favorite books is Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, which is basically like a history of the humankind. Is this making me a better entrepreneur? Is this making me a better at anything I do? No, but like, I love that book. And it's, it's a book that I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna read again, <laughs> where again, like, why would I do that? What is the utility of doing that? No, I like to learn. And in just in the same way, it's like, in the same way that it's satisfying to feel your body move and grow and improve, it's very satisfying to feel your brain grow and improve and make new connections and so on can do that for the joy of doing it. And finally, if you have ever played a video game, then you understand why or what drives me when it comes to entrepreneurship. It's not all that drives me and we can get into that, but a, a really important part. So if you've ever played a video game, because what utility does that have? Why are you playing this video game? Why, why are you really playing it? Right? Is there something, is it because you feel inadequate? Is it because you want to get laid and you're like, hey, if I'm good at Call of Duty, I'm gonna get laid, is that why? I'm wondering who's ever had that thought. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Know? Well, maybe nowadays with like Twitch and streamers and stuff, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. that, could, uh, yeah. that could get you there. Yeah, so, but, so if you're playing a game, you're probably playing it because you want to be playing it because there's something enjoyable about that activity and you like to play the game and you like to get better at it and you like it even if it even if not every moment to moment part of it like feels bad when you lose but even if not every moment of playing the game is enjoyable overall you want to play the game and it's fun to do and it's fun to feel yourself getting better at it and entrepreneurship is a game like business building is a game okay 
it's very close, to, and I think you can understand this perfectly if you've ever played a game like Civilization or or any you know kind of tycoon game, any kind of economics game, strategy game. That is just a slightly simplified version of what entrepreneurship in the real world is like. You've got all kinds of rules and all kinds of complex interactions, and it's like I think life in that sense is, is this great open world simulation basically it's like you can do almost anything and everything you do has all kinds of subtle and complex interactions and effects and everything else and you can set yourself a goal and then it's very very challenging you have all these challenges to overcome all these problems to solve and and as you keep doing it you get better and better at it and is it like, why would i stop doing that this is great fun plus i get paid in actual money which is better than most games can claim you know <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is one of my favorite games to play. Um, and I use entrepreneurship as a vehicle to do the things I want to do. So I do a lot of work with groups of people and I like to teach people. I like to, be, I like to basically be a mentor to people. And through my business activity, I give myself opportunities to mentor other people and help other people grow. Again, I'm sure you could try and find some Freudian explanation about what true, you know, actually uh, just some weird incestuous thing is the real reason why I do this. But <laughs> it's, like, it's like, no, I like doing this. And it's not that hard to understand. Um, you know, I, I do things that are like creative and challenging and interesting. And it's all kind of under the umbrella of entrepreneurship, which is happens to be how I make my living, right? And so that is basically what drives me. Or that's the that's the reason. That's why I keep doing it every day. And there's also there are deeper motivations, which is that you know I've ever since I was very young, I've kind of wanted to, I've kind of wanted to improve the world in some way. I felt for some reason, and I don't know why this is. Maybe it was my exposure to all kinds of like hero stories, you know, comic books and things like that, that just gave me the sense that this is something. It's just something I want to do. I, I want to somehow contribute to the betterment of the world in whichever, in whichever way I can. And that is something that drives me. But yeah, they, like what more do you want? <laughs> Basically, what more do you want? Does it really have to be? Do we have to add some kind of self-loathing or inadequacy for this to start making sense? I think this, I think this, this problem, I think the, the thing that we can really help people with, the thing that I'm interested in helping people with, is dropping all of this unnecessary baggage, you know? And this this baggage that the inadequacy stuff, because it's amazing how a person can keep this around if they think that it has some perceived benefit. Yeah. And then what and then asking like what comes after that? You do the things the things that you enjoy. Um and that's really interesting because I often think that if a person say is procrastinating on a particular thing for a really prolonged length of time because we all procrastinate every now and then but like unless like, although you don't but like <laughs> well we all like um if we're procrastinating on something for a long a long time something that some goal we're trying to achieve i would at a certain point start asking the person do you really want this yeah or is it so is it some other kind of is it someone else you're trying to impress or someone else is, is this your goal or not mm -hmm. do you enjoy doing this or are you doing this from a place of fear or whatever and I think that a person who is going from a kind of shame-driven background, like they've, they've been shame-driven for so long, switching to a place of acting from self-acceptance will probably go through a bit of a tumultuous period of change because they, because through their shame-driven sort of motives, they've built up a bunch of things in their lives and a bunch of ideas as to who they are and who they should be and what they should do. And there'll be some fear associated with that when we say, well, when you accept yourself, when you let go of all of that and then just do what, what you're compelled to do, you know, we don't know how your life could change. Mm. And there could be a lot of fear associated with that. It's like, oh shit, I don't know how things would change. Maybe I should just keep doing this because it's safe and it's familiar. Yeah. Yeah, 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 You know, so I think this is something that I'm really, really interested to help people do and to do myself. Yeah. And yeah, yeah it's also... And I think and we will get more into like how to do this. And of course, it's not it's, it's not like you'd flip a switch no. and achieve self-acceptance, right? Um, but we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. But I also want to say, you know, yes, of course, 
like let's let's just be clear about this. I'm not talking about some kind of a magical end state of I only do things I love every day. I follow my passion. Everything is just joy and happiness. No. Again, let's let's start with the workout example, right? This morning I was doing a workout and by the end of it, I was just tanked. I was like, I could not keep doing the sets. And I basically actually had to cut the workout short. So there were more sets that I planned to do. I just couldn't do them. I was in this state where, you know, I'd do like one rep and then I'd be panting, (laughs) you know? So it's like, okay, was this a lot of fun? Well, no, in the moment, this this is very hard to do, you know, (laughs) it's very hard. And equally, like with my my experience of building businesses, unbelievably hard. I've had unbelievably hard times doing this. And you can see that, like I I posted uh, for a while, I, I created like a yearly content piece where I'd be like, looking back at the last year. It's like several times in a row, I'm like, this was the hardest year ever. <laughs> <laughs> Every year saying yeah. the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so it's like unbelievable. Like sometimes the amount of problems that we've had to work through and yet just hardships and and unbelievably, you know, thousands upon thousands of hours of hard work done. There are many, many times when it's like this really sucks and I'm I'm not just frolicking in the fields of my passion, you know. But overall, just like with the workout, if you ask me, okay, how was this workout? It was it was brutal. So okay, so you're never gonna work out again then, right? No. We're gonna do it again tomorrow. And maybe that seems like, well, isn't that the paradox or something? Well no. It's you're not only I think the mistake here is yes, we're generally interested in pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain, but not only. Like there are things that are worth doing for their own sake, even if they're not comfortable the entire time. And this is the same, this is the same with exercise and it's the same with learning and it's the same with entrepreneurship. A lot of this is really hard and sometimes it's overwhelming, sometimes it's really difficult. But listen, I'd rather be doing this than doing something else I'd be suffering anyway. I'd be suffering some other problem if I was doing something else, right? But this difficult thing is in line with my values, in line with my goals. It pays really well. It is, I'd rather be doing this and I'd rather be struggling to do this. And and like I said, it's basically both, right? Sometimes it's a struggle, sometimes it's beautiful. But I'd rather be doing this hard thing than doing some other hard thing. And yeah, if I tried to live up to someone else's expectation, I'd maybe be working a job I hate. I'd be ha- having all this self-loathing and so on. Well, I'd also be suffering, you know? But I'd rather be doing this suffering than that suffering. Pick your poison. Yeah. Yeah. So with that said, let's let's talk a bit about... I mean, let's go even further and say, well, how do you develop self-acceptance? Yes, that was, if, that was the other thing I was going to yeah. talk about. So if we've managed to convince someone that, okay, maybe developing self-acceptance is actually useful, how do we do that? And let me let me just add one more thing here. It is self-acceptance can make you a lot better at what you do, and it can help you reach your goals much more effectively, if for no other reason than that it lowers tension and it frees up bandwidth in your brain. Because, you know, for me... If you looked at me in the past at some point before I did this work on myself, I'd be trying to work on a on a business or on whatever I'm working on at the time. And I would have this whole thing going on in my head where it's like, you're such a loser, you failed at everything. Oh my God, you've, you fucked it up again and so on and so forth, right? But now I'm doing a thing and that's not happening in my head. But that's clearly not making me worse, right? I'm not worse at doing my work because I don't have a constant self negative self talk loop going on in my head and in in a similar way just by you you kind of eliminate this tension and this background static and if nothing else it just frees up some capacity it frees up some brain bandwidth that you didn't have before so if nothing else that should be the reason why you pursue self acceptance yes 100% and the thing is i can i can echo that because for the longest time, I was trying to build like an online coaching business, but I had all of these self-loathing, negative thoughts about this in my mind. I'm basically saying, you're not good enough. 
um, no one will ever no one will ever sign you up as a as a coach. You'll do a bad job, and all these other things. And the, the, the weird thing about that is, if I fixate on those thoughts, it kind of in some way it's a self fulfilling prophecy. Because like the more I'm fixated on this stuff, and the more I can't rid myself of it, the less effective I am. The less um, positive effect I have on other people and all this other stuff. So it is kind of a, this weird self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Um, but when I saw, well, I mean, this has happened more in this past six months. Ridding myself of all of this, um, this self loathing negative baggage, means that I can ask myself what games I want to play. Now, um, and obviously for the past sort of like three, four weeks, I've been working on this. Right, I want to get five, five coaching clients. And that's not felt like something, I need to do this. I need to be a coach. I need people to see me <laughs> as a coach. I need to be this kind of person. Like, there's, there's none of that. It's just, why don't I just get five clients? Because it'll be a bit, bit of extra pocket money. I'll get to have this cool, cool coaching dynamic with people. I get to meet people new. I get to see the, the fulfillment of them. I get to experiment with different stuff with them, have some cool conversations. That is my motivation for it. Yeah. And it's been going way better and way easier <laughs> yeah. than, it, than it was when I was just sat in my room. It's like, oh, what content can I put out? You know, it's, it's just, you know what I mean? It's this, it's this, um, this sort of effortless flow mm. of action mm. that doesn't seem to be this tension. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, it's, and, it, and when I was in that tense state, which looking back was a few, a few years, to be honest, um, I would often become envious of people that just seem to have this flow about them and mm. good things were happening all the time. <laughs> I was like... How is it? How is it that they get it so easily? How? Why, why, am, why am I having all this tension? I'm sat here, but like things aren't coming so easily to me. And these people, it seems that they were just more effective. They seem to be more productive. Yeah. And they were just getting things done and they were just enjoying what they did. And that's infectious. Um, yeah, let's link to the, by the time this published, this will be published too. Uh, let's link to the high performance, low tension post def and video. So that explores more in depth this relationship between tension and performance yes um because yeah basically that that's kind of an exploration of that but the bottom line is your best performance is going to happen at low tension and self-acceptance is a way yeah. to achieve lower tension exactly yeah. excellent so how do we accept ourselves shane yeah so Lay how do we us. accept ourselves so so i'm gonna start there's there's a lot to this basically and we're, i'm sure we're not going to get to all of it here but i'm going to start with something that might be controversial here because I'm going to say that you start by intellectualizing it, which is often a bit of a, a no-no, right? It's like, oh, you can't, you can't intellectualize your way out of an emotional problem. Yeah, have you tried? Because <laughs> I have. <laughs> I have. And here's the thing. There is, and I'm not saying you can completely solve any emotional problem with an intellectualizing, right? So okay, you can stop typing that comment. <laughs> <laughs> you can stop mid-sentence. Right? Like, yes. mm, I almost pressed enter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, write the comment. It's fine. Um, <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Here's why I would start with, um, with basically take a rational approach to it and really think about this and, and write about this and think about the, the forms that, that a lack of self-acceptance takes for you, really explore that and see if these are things that you actually believe. So you, ha you will have, as a lack of self-acceptance, you will have, this, this has different expressions, right? Maybe it's some kind of self-hatred, some kind of self-loathing, a feeling that you're not enough and so on and so forth. And it will usually manifest in specific thoughts that you have over and over again. So, for example, every time you stand in front of the mirror, you think the same thing. Every time you see your bank balance, you think the same thing. Every time you meet a certain person, you think the same thing. And that is kind of how this lack of self-worth and self-acceptance expresses itself in certain thoughts about why you're not enough and what you can't accept about yourself, right? And you can start deconstructing such thoughts. And you can start, you can think, okay, a thought that I keep having is whenever I do X, um, and again, let's let's just use the physical example because I think it's it's quite useful. I stand in front of the mirror, I go, oh, I'm so chubby, I'm such a failure, I'm such a loser. Nobody's ever going to love me because I'm such a loser. And I have to be, I would, you know, if I had a six pack, if I was in better shape, then maybe I would have a girlfriend. But because I look like this, right, that's that's why I don't deserve to be accepted, neither by myself nor by anyone else. That's the story I'm telling myself. Well, let's explore that. Do you really believe that this is true? 
And one way you can explore that is, so first of all, write down what the story is that you tell yourself. And then you can ask yourself, do I believe this about other people? Do I believe this and treat other people the same way as I treat myself? And maybe the answer is yes. Maybe if I see someone else's job, I go, you're also a loser. You also don't deserve love. <laughs> okay, that's possible. But I think in many cases we'll find that, oh, no, actually, you know, if my friend has the same problem as me or if my friend has the same inadequacy or whatever as me, I don't talk to them like I talk to myself. I don't think that they don't deserve anything good because they have this trait or don't have this trait, you know. And then right away, then it's like, hold on, so why why is that? What's going on here? And this is one of the insights that I had early on, where it's like, I was playing this very strange, like I was doing very strange mental gymnastics, where for many things, I was the sole exception out of all the billions of people on earth. It's like, there's one rule for everyone else and a different rule for me. Well, how does that make any sense? Mm. Okay. And... And one important insight there. So, so basically what I'm saying is, right, other people who, yeah, don't have a six pack or other people who aren't so smart or other people who make this mistake, they're fine and they deserve happiness. But I don't. I'm the unique exception. I'm the unique exception in the world. And the simple idea here is, look, you're not that special. You're just not that special. You're just one of us. Okay. You're one of the billions. And it just doesn't make sense that there's a different rule for you than for anyone else. So if someone else who has the same thing as you still deserves love and acceptance, then so do you. Mm. And this is something where in writing, you can have an aha moment about this. You can have a moment about this where it goes, oh my God, this is what I'm doing. And it can disarm the, the emotional component of it because the thought will still come up. Then you go, no, I, don't, I can't believe this anymore because it's too ridiculous now. This thought that before I just was on board with it, I would look at myself and think, oh, you're such a loser, blah, blah, blah. And I would just go with that. But now that I've actually thought about it, I'm like, no, that's ridiculous. That's completely ridiculous. Yes. That, so that sounds like there's there's just some thoughts that have been exi- that, that have been existing in you for so long or some beliefs that may have originated at a time far earlier in your psychological development. And you've just not updated it yet. Mm-hmm. You've not refreshed the page. You've not had a look at that belief from where you are now yeah. and looked at it from the angles that would be necessary to to see how ludicrous it is. And an example for this in my life would be um, this sort of Uber Eats addiction I have to like ordering pizza and stuff. Now, I can kind of trace back to where this, um, you know, this sort of conditional self-worth around this generated from. And it was basically my father when I was like quite chubby when I was a kid. My dad was like worried about me getting chubbier. So he basically would um, kind of, in some sense, communicate subtle shame signals around me eating like greasy food or something. Mm. And this like persisted for a long time. So it's like one of these trace things. And it was really interesting because you you introduced this idea to me uh, when we first met around that sort of time when I came mm. to Lisbon. And I sort of used that on the, like when, I order, when I'd order food or something. Um, and I thought, okay, well, do I, if people, if, if people around me just ordered food all the time, what would I think about that? Would I think, oh my God, give you look at yourself, Jesus Christ, you need to sort this out. Like, would I really think that? And I'm like, no, I wouldn't at all. I'd just be like, all right, do you think? I literally, I wouldn't feel any emotion whatsoever. I'd be like, do you think? All right. So in your case, did this realization diffuse the emotion and the thoughts you had about yourself doing it? 100%. Yeah, it really did. And it was like, I just, it's really interesting because when you reach these little breakthroughs, you can have weird reactions. I just laughed. I just laughed about it. It's as if I was relieving the tension of it. I was laughing my ass off about it. I was like, why, how have I believed this for so long? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I order food. Therefore, I'm a bad person. It's like, whoa. (laughs) It's why, such a bizarre why, why thing. Why am yeah. I the exception? <laughs> and why would you be? Yeah. You know, like Uber Eats exists for a reason. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's not just because it's just me. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but like, but that's just one example of that um, of that working. And yeah. another thing, a point I wanted to make about that is, um, yes, intellectualizing it and everything, I'm completely with you. But I will say that this requires a certain degree of self awareness. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway a certain degree of being able to introspect effectively and sort of work out 
the actual underlying beliefs about this stuff. And an example, another example I have is from a dating life. Uh, for a while I struggled with, and, and to a degree, sometimes still do, is when I'd see like an attractive woman. Um, so like in, in the past, I just, I would have no, like I think I could approach her or could I, I could go say hello or something. But for, for the longest time, it would just be like, no, immediate, immediate, no. Just immediate, oh, she's attractive and that's it. So you feel like you don't deserve it or something? Yeah. And and it took me a while to sort of come to this conclusion of and to sort of look at that situation from a more critical perspective and be like, well, what's actually what what thoughts am I actually having in that moment? And then and then I could start to uh, like the more experiences of that I had from this sort of perspective where I was looking for what beliefs were going on, then I could start to notice that hang on. Deep down, I don't actually think I believe that that will go well and I don't actually deserve I should I have no business talking to that woman and all this stuff but the point I'm making is for the longest time that felt normal yeah that felt like implicitly I must have just assumed that everyone feels that way and there's no other alternative so I guess the thing I'm saying is that uh, for certain things it's important that you over time you develop this sort of self-awareness around it and if you can't immediately tease apart what beliefs are or what what are driving it then I guess just pay when when you are experiencing something that causes like an emotional response, just that's like a call to pay attention. That's that's yeah. that's the the point I wanted to make. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. Um, th and that was the same for me when I started doing this. It's not like I sat down with a complete clarity about here are exactly the thoughts I have and the situations I have them in. So on. no, that's something you develop over time. Yeah, uh, but even just sitting down with the intention of okay how what does this actually look like what does my lack of self-acceptance actually look like and then starting to explore that and yeah like you say it will take time to start pinpointing oh these are the things i actually tell myself here's a story i tell myself and like i said you just it you just get on board with it you never question it until you catch it and go hold on and then you think about it and you write about it yeah so and that's one thing to do. I also want to continue this a little bit because there is the option that you say, yes, this is true for everyone else as well. So if I don't have a six pack, I don't deserve to be loved and I will never have a girlfriend. And everyone else who doesn't have a six pack is also a total loser and a failure. And they also don't deserve to be loved. Well, then you can also explore that and say, well, first of all, is this true? You know, is it true that no man who doesn't have a six pack has ever had a girlfriend or a wife? It's like, okay, no, apparently not. And then maybe some other belief comes up. Well, she doesn't actually like him. She's not attracted. It's just because he has money. And you go, okay, well, is that true? <laughs> is, is it true that if you don't have a six pack, then you must have money. Otherwise, you can't get a girlfriend or a wife. And again, you can probably find examples. But, oh, damn it. <laughs> there, is a, there are actually like hundreds of millions of examples <laughs> of this not being true. Yeah, I'm thinking of this uh, this hypothetical person who just has all these really strong opinions like, well, that's a six pack, he must have money. And you eventually just find him a couple where this mm -hmm. guy's just got a belly, not got much money, and he's got a missus who absolutely loves it. It's like, mm -hmm. what about this? Like, there must be something. There's something. Yeah. And you may be, and look, depending on, on where you're at, you might really want to cling to some deeply toxic beliefs. You might want to cling to the idea that, no, no, this is, you know, it's not, it's, it's all fake or something, or she actually, she's only using him or something. There must be something bad here that I can hold on to, right? Because I really want to keep this, this bad feeling for some reason, right? We can be very attached to our bad feelings. But even there, like you can definitely, all I ask is that you are totally honest about it and you write about it with honesty and say, this is what I believe. And you can keep deconstructing this down to what is your basic philosophy of the world? Because you have, you have that, it, it, for most people, it's not very well developed, it's not very deliberately developed. And you can, at some point, you, you get to the point where you realize, okay, I have some decisions to make about what I want to believe about the world, how I want to see other people and myself in the world. Because yes, of course, you can live like that. You can choose to say that, you can choose to believe that the world is this cruel place where only the highest performers who are always perfect without exception, only they deserve anything good and everyone else can burn in hell, right? You can believe that. And maybe that's what you want. 
And there are entire ideologies that basically sound a bit like that, right? Where you have to live up to this crazy idea and otherwise you deserve eternal punishment. You can choose to believe that. But you can also, you have to then, or you can ask yourself, how does that make me show up in the world? And do I want to show up as that in the world? And is that the truth? Or is that just a way of looking at the world? And is there other, other possible ways of looking at the world? And so you can come to the conclusion where, you know, maybe you can change your mind about this where you say, okay, I used to believe that, <laughs> yeah, that any relationship between a man and a woman has to be somehow transactional or fake or so on. Um, and and basically I have to I have to practically trick someone into wanting me by having a six pack and flashing lots of money. And that's somehow how the world works. But I can also choose to believe that, you know what, maybe... I do live in a world where, you know what, I've sometimes liked someone who isn't perfect. And maybe that, maybe I'm not the only one. Again, maybe I'm not the only exception. You know, maybe other people sometimes also like someone who's not perfect. And maybe I could look at the world as a place where imperfect people can love and accept each other at least some of the time. And I could be one of those imperfect people. And you can see that this is a, a no less functional worldview. Than, than your, you know, kind of perfection and hatred-filled worldview that you had before. And it all comes from asking, is it true? There's, yeah. some, there's something that I used to love asking my clients is, how's that working out for you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is an invitation to, uh, to, to get them to examine the consequences of these beliefs mm -hmm. um, or their actions. Yeah, exactly. And it's just that inquiry and... and that inquiry can take you really far. It's not going to take you really far immediately the first time you try it. But if you dedicate yourself to that inquiry of, yeah, is this true? What do I really believe about this? And you keep digging. That can lead to a great degree of freedom. And that can lead to a great degree of self-acceptance. Now, there's also another thing you can do. And especially if the, if the self-awareness thing is difficult, right? If you find it difficult to actually pinpoint the things. Um, the, the expressions of your lack of self-acceptance. You can brute force it. You can brute force it by basically... Um, so again, you have loops of thoughts that are reinforcing your current beliefs and leading to some of your current behaviors. And you can simply choose, right? If you choose, if you say, I want to develop self-acceptance, I want to learn how to accept myself, but I don't know how to do it or where to start... You can start brute forcing it by, for example, writing, uh, I deeply and completely love and accept myself just the way I am right now, over and over and over again. Or even maybe that's too much. Maybe, you know, the love thing is a bit much. <laughs> maybe it's just, I accept myself. And you start writing that, I accept myself, I accept myself, I accept myself. And you might find that it, you have a resistance to this, that you can only write it if at the same time you tell yourself, but I don't really believe this, right? that's fine. So you keep writing it. I accept myself, but I don't really believe this. I accept myself, but I don't really believe this. And so on. And you keep doing it until it's mundane. I accept myself, whatever. And I did this, I did this for a long time where, and I do this every day. I'd write like a page full of that until it becomes totally mundane. And then you can start turning up the heat a little bit. I accept myself as I am right now. Ooh, Really? Ooh, no, I don't believe that. This this relationship with yourself starts to get a bit saucier. You know? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Start to turn up the notch a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> exactly. So yeah, I accept myself as I am right now. Ooh, tough, right? <laughs> so you write that again, and you keep doing it, and this maybe for days or weeks until it becomes mundane. I love and accept myself just as I am right now. Again, ooh, that's mm, that touches something. That's hard. I stretch that yeah. one. Mm, okay, so you write that and you keep doing it until it's Monday. And you can keep escalating this. Eventually, it's basically like, and you can, uh, look, you can easily think yourself of how to increase the, the difficulty level or the intensity level of this. You know, you can you can say it out loud. It's like, for sure. <laughs> I couldn't have said this out loud. I couldn't have said out loud. I accept myself. Mm. <laughs> that would have killed me as a teenager. <laughs> I would have imploded. <laughs> <laughs> I accept myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, you can say it out loud. You can say it out loud while you look at yourself in the mirror and so on, right? At some point you can say, I love myself as I am. And it's just mundane. Like for me, when I say I love myself as I am right now, this has the emotional quality of saying the sky is blue. 
There's just there's nothing emotional to this. This is not a big moment of oh my god, I've I've dared say it on a podcast. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's just it's just true. It's completely mundane, right? And I do think that again, this is alone. This will not do it. But I call this brute forcing because you're starting to add a counterforce to the thought loops that you have. You're already repeating stuff to yourself all the time. And it might be it might be verbal, but or it might be kind of emotional, but you have loops. I mean, it might feel silly. Why am I writing? A, I accept myself a hundred times. If you could completely monitor, like if you could have like a printout of what goes on in your brain, you would see that you're already doing this with other thoughts. You know, you think I'm a loser, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, probably like hundreds of times a day. And so this is just, you're starting to tip the scale a little bit with thoughts that you choose to install in all this mess. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than just this absolute rap sheet of just madness going yeah. off on the page. Well, I like what you said about um, sort of varying degrees of, of intensity with this, because for me, I love myself didn't work for ages, mm. for so long. It's like, I love myself. I was like, I might as well just have spoke in Mandarin you know, yeah. that's that's what that what meaning that thing has. Yeah, yeah. So there was no there was no connection whatsoever. Um, but the 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 uh, the phrase that really sort of cracked something was there is no reason why I am not enough right mm. now. And the moment where this this had an impact was before I went to a house party full of people. I didn't know any. I didn't know. I only knew like two people at the party. There was like mm. thirty people there. And I, I, before I walked in, I was like. Oh, getting the, the social anxiety again. This was like a year or two ago. And I was just like, oh boy, okay. You know, I gotta be people in there. Oh, duh, duh, palms are sweating. And then I remember reading this in the blog the day before. And I was like, right, okay. There is no reason why I'm not enough just as I am right now. And then for some reason I was like, hmm, I guess that's true. Yeah. There's no reason why. And then I was like trying to find a reason why I was not enough. And I was like, <laughs> I couldn't find one. I was like, what does that even mean? Not enough. Why would I not be enough? Oh, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and then I could yeah. safely say I walked into the party and I was just like, I felt great. I was like, this is actually a hell, a hell of a lot different than usual, mm. you know. Um, but it's because I'd found the right statement yeah, that that's, matches. It's a beautiful, like, subversive statement. There's no reason for it. Yeah. There's no. There's no reason. You know. It's not that's, like it's not a feeling of like I am great. Yeah, I'm yeah, amazing. Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. If you if you're not quite there yet, mm -hmm. just there's no reason. But I invite you to find one. Yeah. Try and find one. Try and find a reason why you're just not enough in every way right now. Mm -hmm. And if you, you try and find one, it's like, uh, and, and you're being honest. Mm -hmm. If you can, your mind can find any reasons for anything. But if you're being truthful, you're like, I can't really find a reasonable response to that, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. So one more thing, I want to, one more tool I want to add to the tool belt here is uh, meta meditation. Hmm. So also called loving kindness meditation or compassion meditation. And in the show notes, we'll link to my absolute favorite, like free guided meta meditation. Absolutely love this. Um, but there's many, many, you can find loads of these. But I just want to briefly explain what this is. So there's the there's a practice of meta, which is like a five stage practice where essentially what you do is stage one is you wish yourself well. And this might be by repeating a mantra like, may I be happy, may I be well, may I be free from, free from suffering or something like that. But the, the idea is not the repetition of the words. The idea is that you really feel well-being or, or well-wishing towards yourself. And you do that for a bit. Then you think of a good friend or someone you love and you wish them well. And you focus on that person. You, you, you focus on the feeling of, I wish them well. And then you think of a stranger. And you focus on wishing them well. And you think of someone who's like an enemy, someone who has, you have difficulties with, and you focus on wishing them well. And then you start just expanding outwards. You start wishing everyone well. That's the, that's the basic like structure of this meditation. And you might find different stages of this very challenging. So for some people, maybe the, the first stage of wishing yourself well, maybe that's the challenging one. But then when you think of someone else, you can easily wish them well. Or maybe when it comes to a person you have conflict with, you, you find it very difficult to wish them well. And, and that's perfectly fine. You just go through this practice and you see what happens. And I think that one of the things it does is that it helps you practice well-wishing. And eventually, so if you find it easy to wish your friend well, but not yourself, if you do this meditation a couple of times, it's like, 
you now know what well-wishing feels like, and it's easier to just direct that towards yourself, just as a matter of practice, all of a sudden, right? <laughs> and it is really like, even if you really struggle with this, if you just practice this for a while, you'll suddenly find it really easy and you'll find it much easier to feel empathy for someone you have difficulties with. Be like, you know what? Yes, okay, yes. Maybe there's some base part of me is like, I want revenge. I want bad things to happen to you. But if I really think about it, I'm like, no, no, I don't I don't want bad things to happen to you. I still want you to be, I'd still rather live in a world where you're happy and well off, you know? And it's just a, it's, it's a very old practice you know it's been around for a long time you're you're getting something that this is not a fad right this is not a fad you're getting this is a like an ancient technology in a way meta meditation this is a really well tested method of developing compassion and kindness towards others and towards yourself and it's also i find it one of the most enjoyable forms of meditation to do and yeah that's another that's just another tool so if you want to develop greater self-acceptance, that's one of the things you can do. If you spend anything from 10 minutes to 30 minutes a day doing that, it will absolutely change your your attitude. Brilliant. And we'll, we'll link all the good shit in the show notes. So the three, um, just recap the three things. Mm -hmm. First thing was. So the first thing is to rationalize, to write about and, and explore your lack of self-acceptance rationally. Do I really believe these things? What are the stories I tell myself? Is this really true? Do I feel like this about other people? And so on. Really explore the stories you're telling yourself when you are, you know, self-loathing or self-hating. Hmm. So that's the intellectualizing it. Yeah. Second one, brute force in it. Yeah. And that's just repeat, 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 repeat. <laughs> Rinse and repeat until it sinks in. Yeah. Third thing is meta meditation. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah, I think that's that's a good place to start. And, you know, if there's demand for this, we can definitely go deeper into this. Uh, it's, a, it's a long, long journey to develop. Like there's many layers of self-acceptance and self-love, right? This is a place to start. And yeah, we can we can definitely go deeper into this. But this, if you even just do this, that just takes you to another level of existence. <laughs> in, in You know, over the span of, of a few years, that takes you to a completely different state of being. And it's pretty damn good to be here. <laughs> it's it's much better than the alternative yeah. so so we hope with this episode we have um sort of put the case forward that shame and inadequacy feelings are not the optimal way well you might find some cases where oh inadequacy got them here you might mm -hmm. find the odd case where that could be true but for most people it is not the optimal way of of living well and even of achieving your goals as Shane as Shane yeah. provided earlier examples of the ways in which life 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 has changed and all these external markers of success have actually improved as a you know since adopting a self acceptance practice so hopefully what we've done is is dispel the myths around this uh, but mainly the myth that shame drives success um, and and i would say that if you have a counter argument to this let us know like i'm i'm happy to do another round of this taking apart people's reasons why they need to cling on to shame and guilt and feeling bad about themselves in order yeah. to achieve, yeah. I'd really love to hear their comments on that. Yeah. I yeah. really would, because there's some things that I'm just thinking, there's, there's gotta be more to this because there's reasons why this keeps coming up in yeah. podcasts and stuff. Yeah. And we, we, it's very unlikely we've covered it here. So if you've got any, ex, any extra comments, put them below. And hopefully we've given you a few techniques and a few methods for, for attaining this sort of, the stepping onto the path of self-acceptance in your own life too. Um, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you know anyone who could benefit from hearing this, then please send them this. And also, if you hear other people talk about this on a podcast or in a book or whatever, like send them this. It's like, I want, I really feel like this, this is like a knowledge gap right now. This is a knowledge gap in the self-development space. There are loads and loads of people who I think could do better and like serve their audience better if they understood this. So... I'm basically throwing down the gauntlet. Send these people here and I want to hear your excuses. I want to hear your reasons. Like I am going to take on anyone um, who wants to who wants to debate with, you know, taking the other side of self-acceptance is good for personal growth and ambition. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take on any 
any commerce, any argument on this. You hear that? The sleeves are getting rolled up. <laughs> Bring it on. Let's uh, let's let's get some of these arguments in. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that now. Let's get some uh, let's get some of the comments, and uh, we'll uh, we'll take them on in another episode. Cool. All right. So that's it for this episode. Subscribe on YouTube. Leave reviews on Apple Podcasts. Um, what else? Get on the newsletter. Newsletter. Check out acario.com. Uh, check out all the stuff on the website. Check out the blog. Check out the Clips channel as well. Although you, if you've watched all of this, you wouldn't need to. But <laughs> Anyway, just watch it anyway. We need the watch time. We, we, need, <laughs> we desperately yeah, we need, need the We need YouTube time. to throw us a bone. I mean, as of this recording right now, we've got like 20 subscribers on that channel. So please send us a bone. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank that you. Until next time, guys. Take See care. You.